At this time, welcome everyone. Uh, today marks the final presentation for this year's Central Region's yearly Zoom presentations. Today's presenter is Bob Fincham, uh, who really doesn't need an introduction for most members, but for any new members joining us today, uh, Bob was instrumental in the founding and development of the society and the promotion and introduction of conifers to the gardening public. That's a big thing. Uh, he is regarded as a great plantsman, educator, and author. Uh, Bob is actually the de facto historian of the Conifer Society. Uh, Bob was the keynote speaker at last year's regional meeting in Dayton, Ohio. Those attending today's presentation who were not at last year's regional meeting are in for an exceptionally entertaining, educational, and memorable experience. Mr. Finchin, the floor is yours. Well, after that introduction, I uh, have a tough act to follow. <laughs> My talk is about why with conifers. Um, why, how, what, where, when. Uh, it's a talk I put together about three years ago, back before COVID hit, for the uh, Central Region meeting. We're actually with, it's going to be the national meeting. And uh, it, uh, it kind of got held up for a while. It was for the Conifer College. It was not for the uh, general you know, for everyone, it was for people who signed up for it as a class. It was well received. I was asked to uh, put it on a Zoom meeting, which I've never done before. And so uh, this is new for me. So if I have any problems, you'll have to uh, bear with me a little bit. Also, I'm fighting a uh, cold. So uh, if I cough once in a while, uh, You'll have to kind of bear with me a bit. Okay, now. Okay, conifers. Why, what, when, how? Um, conifers are interesting. They, some grow tall and narrow. Some are yellow. Some are pendulous. Uh, some are blue. Some get little witched brooms in them. Some have an oval branch structure, and some show a spiral growth. Okay. Now, some of the topics in my PowerPoint, we're going to look at taxonomy, shape, color, witches' brooms, reproduction of conifers, water flow, growth, death, and logging on conifers. So we have quite a bit to look at. And uh, I, I move fast in some parts and uh, a little bit slower in others. Okay. Now, when? When does a species conifer become a cultivar? Okay, here's an example of two cultivars. Pinus strobus blue shag is a cultivar. So is Pinus strobus gold candles. Um, selected conifer becomes a cultivar when it is uh, demonstrating some new property or characteristic that makes it desirable for the garden. And uh, Pinus strobus blue shag is a dwarf with bluish foliage. Pinus strobus gold candles flushes yellow candles in the spring. So they have a characteristic that makes them nice or an ornamental form in the garden. But they don't become a cultivar, and the name is not accepted until they've been propagated, and they show that that characteristic carries forward in the offspring. Then they can be considered a cultivar. Just finding a, a new, different conifer and putting a name on it does not make it a cultivar until it's been propagated, and that characteristic continues. Now, the names of conifer cultivars are part Latin and part fancy. Fancy meaning uh, modern language. That 
started in 1958. Leave the Latin out. But some people still stick Latin on these names. Latin like Nana, Pendula, Fastigiata, and so forth. Um, <laughs> these are uh, terms that have no, no uh, real narrow meaning in today's world. Like minuta can be a whole range of sizes. Um, the the uh, name pendula is way overused. <laughs> so we go with fancy names because the fancy name um, designates the plant a lot more specifically. And a lot of times it does not have anything to do with the... Uh, character of the plant, which is why the plant was selected. Um, trademark on a plant name protects the name, not the plant. Like uh, Pine December Klein Silver Whispers. That trademark part, Silver Whispers, that name is protected. Person cannot use it without having a license. But you can put another name on it, like Klein, and uh, that is the same plant. But the only thing protected was the trademark name. And so you could put a number of names on it because uh, and not get in any legal trouble. It, ethical, that's uh, something a little different. Now, the plant patent protects the cultivar from asexual propagation without a license, such as the first uh, Piscea pungens to have a patent was baby blue eyes. And there's a patent number. That means nobody can propagate this plant without a license. They get in legal trouble if they do. Um, variety describes a plant from a geographic region, like Picea pungent variety Apache. All these Apache is it, used mainly for seed sources. If you uh, collect seeds from Picea pungent in a certain area where they're designated as variety Apache, they'll have certain characteristics that are fairly common. Forma, that's used to designate a growth habit, like uh, by CAB forma pendula. When that's used, the F designates formula, forma, just like V designates variety. Um, with the forma or the variety, the name is not capitalized. This was because Apache is a proper noun. Um, but forma pendula, the P is not capitalized. We see plants, Pisces, ABs, in single quotes, pendula, with the P capitalized, saying it's a cultivar. But if it cannot be traced back to the original plant, it really is not a cultivar. And I'll tell you more on that later. Okay, what is a conifer and what's the relationship between the shape and the environment? Okay, conifer is a Latin word, it's a combination of conus or cone and ferre to bear, meaning the one that bears cones. These are conifers, and there's a cone. Now, this is a specific conifer cultivar, Picea abes acricona. All conifers are what we call gymnosperms. Gymno means naked. That's why like a gymnasium is a place where naked people go. And sperm, that has to do with the seed or reproduction. And so gymnosperms are all, they are, uh, they, include, they include a group of cone-bearing seed plants. And the great majority of them are trees. And there are some that grow more like shrubs. Now, the Taxaceae, U family, we lump them in with the conifers. They are gymnosperms. Strictly speaking, uh, <coughs> well, we have the conifers, but I'm not, they, they have some characteristics that are different than conifers. The biggest characteristic that's different from a conifer is they do not bear cones. They bear uh, something called an arrow, which is a fleshy fruit that surrounds the seed. So the seed is still naked. You can see the seed in there, but it's not surrounded with cone scales surrounded with a fleshy arrow. 
Relationship between conifer shape and environment. Okay, we have an environmental effect on their shapes, like the uh, high altitude conifers. They tend to be uh, narrow, upright, with drooping side branches, such as Picea America, very, very good example. Um, there are a couple of reasons why they evolved this way. <coughs> One is the snow that's common in higher altitudes would tend to bend the branches down and snap them off if they were rigid. And so by having branches that tend to droop, the snow does not break them off. It just kind of bends them down a bit. And um, over the, I don't know, you say the eons or thousands of years, the ones with the stiffer branches tended to be destroyed. And so the, the uh, traits of having drooping branches became more and more common throughout the population. The other uh, advantage of drooping branches is you have more exposure to sunlight in these higher altitudes because the sun never really gets all that high. The sun is fairly low if you're at a higher altitude. And so it allows the plant to collect more sunlight for photosynthesis to occur. <coughs> now, another environmental effect at the higher altitudes is due to wind. And uh, to some extent to the ice crystal that get blown around in the winter. Trees tend to be stunted in the higher altitudes as shown in this picture. Um, wind resistance is less. A tree with high wind resistance is gonna to tend to get snapped off in a storm. And we call them banner trees where all the limbs are kind of on one side. So it's a banner tree and that it's almost like uh, flying a flag. The limbs that would grow on the side toward the wind, the limbs that would grow on the side toward the wind uh, would tend to get stripped by ice crystals. Uh, the needle would get destroyed uh, when the ice crystals are blown around because they're like throwing little daggers at it. And so the, on the leeward side, the branches are protected somewhat by the trunk. And so the foliage is not as uh, damaged by the blowing ice crystals. Now, there are mechanical effects on the shape of a tree. For example, uh, trees want to maintain a center of gravity in line with the main trunk. So if the center of gravity gets too far to one side, the tree can fall over. And they do this a couple of different ways. One way is that when you have a big branch growing out to the side, it'll turn upward and grow upward rather than going on out. I can imagine if this branch continued out this way, it'd be over here and it would pull the tree over and fall across the highway here. This tree, for some reason was growing off at an angle for a while. Now it's turning back. So you have a curvature as this tries to get back to where it's over the center of the base of the tree. Now, the, the, these grow, the, the way the tree does this, uh, we'll talk about a little bit later when we talk about apical dominance. There's age changes. As a tree gets older, the branches develop more and more weight and they tend to get pulled down. Uh, this is important in the survival of the tree uh, because it allows rainwater when it falls on the tree to be distributed out here where the feeder roots are. In a young tree, the branches tend to be more vertical. So the water is diverted in close to the trunk because the feeder roots are in close to the trunk when the tree is young. <laughs> now this is a vestigiate selection. Um, this vestigiate selection is a uh, Pinostrobus vestigiata, and the branches are vertical on it. But notice what happens when it gets old. The branches tend to diverge and lay out somewhat. But you can tell this is a vestigiate form because if it was a regular pinostrobus, the branches would be going more like this. Now, how does water get up to the top of a tall tree? Or 
how do we get apical dominance? Weeping trees, spiral structure, witches rooms, uh, grafted standards and grafting. That'd be the next section. I'm sorry, kind of like a how section. Now, how does water from down here get up to the top of this tall tree? And we know the water is in there. But this sometimes happens. Now, there are a couple of factors that work here, several factors that work here that moves the water up the tree. Now, air pressure cannot do it because air pressure can only lift water a total of about 32 feet in a tube, and that's it. That's why a hand pump on a well or a suction pump uh, won't work on a well that's deeper than 32 feet. Now, in a tree, first of all, we have the properties of water that are a factor. We have adhesion and cohesion. With adhesion, the water sticks to uh, another surface. For example, you put water in a uh, narrow jar, and you look across the top of the water surface, you'll see it curves up where it contacts the glass. That's because of adhesion. Secondly, cohesion, water molecules hold on to each other. That's why a water strider can run across the surface of a pond because the water molecules hang on to each other. They're what we call covalent molecules. They have positive and negative areas in the molecule and uh, they're electrically attracted to each other. And so with this adhesion and cohesion, the adhesion, here, here's the xylem tube, the adhesion, the water is sticking to the sides of the tube and curving up. And the narrower the tube, the greater this, we call this a meniscus. You get this curvature in here in the water. And if it's tight enough, it can actually contribute to the water moving up the tube because, because these island tubes are very tiny. And then the cohesion works in that the water molecules are sticking together and pulling each other. So the adhesion and cohesion work together to move this up this narrow tube. It's a little bit like what happens in the soil where uh, in the farming areas, uh, you can go quite a while without rain and the crops do well because they get water from the soil. Well, the water moves up the soil uh, by a similar process of cohesion and adhesion. Then transpiration also helps because as the water moves out from the leaves, <coughs> it creates suction. And the suction helps pull the water up these island tubes. So you have, here's the transpiration water coming out. And then you have, this is a xylem out in the leaf, which would be the veins. And the water moves through that because transpiration is pulling water out. Other water comes here to replace it. Water comes up to xylem and out into the leaf and, and moves up to xylem because cohesion and adhesion. There's a little bit of root pressure. It's not major, but there is some, which also contributes somewhat to the whole process. And so you have the root pressure, you have cohesion and adhesion, and you have transpiration all at work. And if you cut a tree down, and basically see it with a cottonwood, um, sometimes water will flow out of it like a spring, and that's from the uh, pressure, the root pressure, pushing the water out. Now, how do conifers become or exhibit ap or develop apical dominance? Here's one that the does not show a typical shape of a conifer. Now, a typical conifer shape would look like the ones in the background, where you have this main trunk. And it goes up, and you have the side branches staying smaller, and you just have the central shoot going up. Something happened here. Apical dominance was lost, and a bunch of side shoots took over. Now, each of the side shoots has apical dominance within its own shoot. So you have the center one going up, and the side ones are suppressed. And you actually have a... Uh, six or seven of these 
uh, apical peak in its own apical dominance. Well, apical dominance occurs. Here's typical growth. Most of the growth occurs here. Notice here's a side shoot that may actually cause a uh, fork to form in this tree. That does sometimes happen, but this has a little bit thicker here, so this will probably dominate. But this terminal bud, or this terminal shoot, suppresses all these side shoots. Now, it's not completely understood, but it seems to be a reaction between auxin and cytokinin. These are two uh, chemicals that we're going to talk about quite fairly often throughout my presentation. Environmental factors are also at work, and environmental factors, mainly nutrients and water, are at work. But here was the main central shoot, but so for some reason, it lost dominance over this side branch and this side branch, both of which, for some reason, turned up. Now, there's a lot here, but the important parts I highlighted in red. Like an oxen, that's endoacetic acid. Uh, you might be familiar with that if you root cuttings, because that's what you get in uh, rooting hormones, uh, endoacetic acid. Now, when you have a fast-growing shoot, oxen is produced in that shoot because it promotes cell elongation. So each cell gets longer, and that each of those cells getting longer causes the whole shoot itself to elongate and get longer. Problem with it is if you get too much oxen, the cells will be damaged. So oxens are moved away from the tip and down the stem. So at, let's say we look at the terminal stem, we have oxen being produced in that terminal stem. And since the oxens are being produced in high quantity and you get the cells elongating, but you're getting so much produced that it could cause damage. And so some of the oxen move down the stem. And when it moves down the stem, it actually suppresses growth in the side branches. And we don't really understand completely how that works. One idea says that the oxen coming down blocks the flow of oxen from a growing side branch. Now, you think about that. You have excess oxen being produced in these new shoots that are growing. And the side branches have terminal shoots that are producing oxens. But the oxen moving down in the trunk prevents the oxen from leaving the side branch. And so there's uh, a, a negative effect because of the excess oxen being held in the side branch. And so the cell elongation uh, slows down uh, and the branch gets stunted. And then the oxen coming down may also deflect nutrients away from the side branch, causing the nutrients to move up to the terminal chute and not feeding the side branch. So the terminal chute is getting most of the nutrients and getting a nice balance with the oxen, whereas the side branch is having the oxen blocked, causing them to be stunted. Now, cytokinin, this is produced in plant roots. So the opposite end, end of the plant. And in certain conditions, it can be do, produced at a bud internode. We'll talk about those later. Uh, when it's produced in plant roots, then it has to be transported up into the tree. So it goes up with the xylem or through the xylem with the water. Now, cytokinin promotes cell divisions. And lateral blood, blood development that does not contribute to elongation. Well, it, it helps to promote, produce more cells. It does not help to make the cells bigger. And it helps lateral bud development. Now, it is in a balance with auxins and it regulates the growth of the later buds and branches. Now, if the auxin flow is interrupted, the cytokinin will stimulate the side bud growth. And when the auction flow stops, uh, when it doesn't come out into the side branch, um, you get additional cytokinin, you get an excess of cytokinin, you may actually develop a witch's broom. 
When I talk about witchy broom later on, I'll be talking about cytokinins and auctions. The main thing to remember is that auctions allow elongation. Cytokinin uh, causes um, multiple bud formation and um, a lot of cell production. And along the balance, the tree grows normal. Now, vestigia conifers. This is apical dominance at work also. What happens here is not, not really understood. And of course, uh, the uh, people who study this stuff um, aren't necessarily people who work with cultivars. They work mainly within the species. But what probably happens here is the is mainly a result of uh, nutrient flow more so than the work of the auxins. Because the side shoots are all growing upward, they're moving upward and uh, producing their auxins. And evident, and the growth is not affected in that the uh, side shoots are stunted to the point where they um, take on the shape of a normal uh, tree or normal species. If you bring in extra food to the terminal or to the central shoot, you're going to get the most growth here. And you'll get less growth on the side shoots because you're not getting as much food there or main nutrients. Um, the weight here, the side shoot, tends to pull it down a bit and farther away, um, allowing perhaps allowing auctions to play a little bit of a role in this. So the flow of auctions from each side shoot must not be blocked. So the, there evidently is not auctions going down here, blocking the flow of auction here, causing this to become stunted. It's because the degree of the slowing of these side shoots and um, it tends to be, or appears to be more a function of what's going on with the nutrients. Now, why do we sometimes get pendulous uh, conifers? Okay, first of all, what's in the name? Well, there are many conifer species that have weeping forms. Here's a Engelman and here's a Norway spruce. Both are weeping forms. Now, if you didn't know what cultivar this was, uh, you just uh, give it the lump name, Piceabe form of pendula. But if you bought it in a nursery, they probably have a Piceabe pendula as a cultivar. Um, but this could be in one, it could be inversa, it could be. Well, it wouldn't be reflexive because it has gone up somewhat. It's actually uh, uh, Wartburg, by C.B. Wartburg, which is a seedling off of uh, Inversa. The uh, problem with the weeping forms and the names is that they tend to come true from seed. It might just be a percentage, like maybe 20%, 30 50% of seedlings are weeping forms. But what happens is you have these weeping forms being grown from seed and then sold under the name pendula. And so when you have a plant you buy as pendula, you don't know if that's traced back to the original or if it's a, a seedling that was grown by a nursery. <coughs> Chances are it's going to be traced back to a seedling form. Also, you lose the tag on this, then you end up just calling it pendula. And so pendula is a form. It's not... It's not a cultivar, and that's true with pine astrobus also, because uh, they come uh, fairly true from seed as well. Now, why do we have the pendulous growth? Here's a pendulous blue spruce and a pendulous uh, golden Norway. Um, lignin is the important term here. <laughs> lignin is what makes. Uh, or forms a cell wall, a cell wall in the plant. It's very rigid, very strong. It is the wood in the uh, tree. When a plant pushes its new growth in the spring, the lignin in here is, is just starting to form. And what happens here, this is a pinostrobus pendula. These branches, in the winter, we're hanging down like this. When the new growth started here, 
it actually pulled the old growth up with it. And it's the, the action of the growth hormone or the hormones in this new shoot and moving through this year old wood that causes it to be pulled up. Now, the lignin that's in here, if it forms and develops like in a normal species, this will not weep. It will not be pendulous. It will be upright because the lignin will support it. But if the lignin forms later than it should, gravity will pull this down. And when after the gravity pulls it down, if the lignin forms then, it is locked in this pendulous position. And if you go trying to bend it up, you'll snap it off because the lignin in there is rigid and it's uh, strong and it's not that flexible. And so it will break. If you have a pinostrobus pendula that is strongly weeping and you want to bring it back up, uh, the only time to even attempt it is in the spring when you see all this happening and everything is softer. Um, I'm not sure what is happening in here with the lignin, but it's been softened to some extent so that it's been, it has bent upward. I think it was being like saturated with water or softened with water or the sap. And so sometimes you can bend this branch back up. But if you try doing it after the lignin has hardened, uh, you're going to snap it off. Likewise, when it's soft and you stake a weeping conifer, get it up higher, you do it when before the lignin has hardened. Once the lignin hardens, it stays in the upright position because that lignin uh, will not get soft enough that it'll fall back over. Now, if we look at the large limbs of a weeping conifer, we see that they're in an oval shape. We call that compression wood. Here's an old um, weeping hemlock at the Honeywell Estate up near the Arnold Arboretum. It's well over 100 years old. Notice the oval shape to the, to the uh, branches. And here's one, a weeping hemlock down at the uh, uh, Longwood Gardens in uh, Kenneth Square. If you looked in underneath there, they wouldn't be as big as these because it's not as old, but the wood would be oval. If you cut a slab of that wood, you'd see this. This is compression wood. Now, you get an acceleration of cambium activity. The wood, the cambium grows faster. It adds more wood quicker, much faster. Um, this wood is 40% heavier than normal wood because there's so much lignin in it. It produces extra lignin. Because what it's trying to do is it's trying to support the branch so that the uh, branch doesn't just snap off. The cells expand longitudinally instead of uh, elongating. They spread crossways and make this stronger. This would be the bottom of the branch. Putting all this extra wood in here to support the weight of this branch as it goes out horizontally so it doesn't just fall to the ground. And this, this is a compression wood. Notice that, all the darkness in it. That's from the lignin. Now, with a, the deciduous tree, the compression wood is called reaction wood because it's in tension. So we don't call it compression wood in a deciduous tree, but in a conifer, it's on the side say, the downward side of the branch. <laughs> if the conifer is leaning as it grows, you're going to get the compression wood on this side of the tree. And so you're not going to have perfectly round trunk. You're going to have a little bit of compression wood here. And if you get compression wood on one side, it uh, reacts differently when it's dried. And so when they go in harvesting the uh, trees in a forest, they look for nice straight ones. If they have one that's leaning, they know they're going to be compression wood on the side and they'll mark it as such. Because when they cut the two by fours or whatever they're cutting out of it, uh, they're going to tend to warp because compression wood has different properties from uh, non-compression wood. And uh, you will get tend to get some shrinkage in it. And uh, you're going to get warpage in the in the lumber that comes from it. Now, if we look at conifers with their color, uh, 
basically you have two different colors in conifers. You have the yellows and you have the blues, uh, which are different than the, you know, different than a normal color of green. We find these nice in gardens because they add color to the garden. Now let's, let's look at the gold ones first. Now, why are some conifers gold? Well, we have different chemicals that provide color to, in the plant world. The chlorophyll, which would be the greens, the carotenoids and flavonoids, which would be the yellows and the oranges, and we have anthocyanin, which would be the reds. Red is very rare in the conifer world, seldom seen. Um, the green, of course, is most common, and these carotenoids, the yellows and oranges, um, are a lot more common than the reds. Now, chlorophyll is a green pigment found in the plant cells, and that does photosynthesis. Now, if we talk about color, there are some a couple of major points to remember with chlorophyll. <coughs> chlorophyll is constantly destroyed by sunlight. We, we don't think of sunlight as destroying chlorophyll. We just think of sunlight as being converted, the energy of sunlight being converted to food or providing the energy to uh, convert carbon dioxide and water to food or sugars. But it's constantly destroyed by sunlight, so it's constantly being replaced. And replacement is fastest in warmer weather. Now, the other thing to remember is that cold weather also destroys chlorophyll. So in, in a cold winter, you have chlorophyll being destroyed in the cells of the conifer. It's being replaced as it's being destroyed, but in the winter, the replacement's a lot slower than it is in the summer. So chlorophyll is destroyed by sunlight and it's destroyed by cold. Now, carotenoids are kind of interesting because they actually do some photosynthesis. Not, not a lot, but some photosynthesis occurs by carotenoids. Important thing about carotenoids and thing to remember are these yellow colors is that carotenoids absorb some of the damaging chemicals that are produced by photosynthesis. So photosynthesis, the chemicals produced, will help destroy some of the chlorophyll. Carotenoids absorb some of those chemicals. They help chlorophyll survive. So they're, they're important to the chlorophyll. And they hold up better in sunlight than chlorophyll holds up. But as long as they're in balance, the tree will be green. Now, the red pigment is only present or visible when carotenoids and chlorophyll are not present and rarely seen in conifers. So we have red, uh, like you get a red shoot, like in uh, Pisces carenta, a uh, red shoot in the spring. That's because the chlorophyll and carotenoids have not formed yet. And if they form, they get rid of the red. And eventually the shoot turns green. Now, if carotenoids are present in small amounts, they cannot protect the chlorophyll in a normal manner. The chlorophyll destruction allows the carotenoids to show. So it's kind of interesting is the yellow, here Pinus strobus Louis, um, the yellow does not show because it has an excess of carotenoids or the yellow pigments. The yellow pigments show because there's fewer of them and they can't protect the chlorophyll. And so an excess of chlorophyll gets killed and then the yellow shows. Now, if you're in the shade, if you do not have the sunlight destroying as much as the chlorophyll, then it would turn green. Now, different parts of the country, why are some conifers gold and in other parts of the country they're not. Well, a lot of it is due to the number of light photons hitting the plant and destroying the chlorophyll. Okay, light photons, that's the little, that's this light energy. That puts the energy, that's the energy that goes into the chlorophyll. Now, if the chlorophyll is not protected by the carotenoids, and the photons are putting their energy into the chlorophyll, 
and processes occurring at a very rapid rate, you have the chemicals being produced that are also damaging to the chlorophyll. And the photons end up, the effect of the photons is such that they end up destroying some of the chlorophyll. If you don't have as many photons hitting the surface of the leaf and hitting the chlorophyll, you don't have as much of the chlorophyll being destroyed. Now we have this theory called haze. Haze is pollutants, sulfates, soot particles, dust particles. And if you have high humidity, these particles tend to clump together and get larger. Now haze absorbs photons. So those photons cannot impact uh, conifer needles or conifer leaves. So they do not impact the chlorophyll. So if you get rid of some of the photons from coming through, then you're not going to destroy as much of the chlorophyll. Now, haze also scatters photons. So sometimes photons are not absorbed, but they bounce off the haze particles. When they bounce off the haze particles, they're no longer coming straight in toward your surface. Now they're coming in at an angle. <clears throat> and so what happens is if you have a conifer growing here, you have your photons coming straight in, they also have the deflected ones coming in at angles where they get into the inner parts of the tree, which is normally heavily shaded. Now you have a little bit of, of the photons getting in to the inner parts of the tree. So what happens is less chlorophyll destroyed. So the tree is not going to be as gold because you have more chlorophyll. Since you have fewer photons coming, you think the tree would be hungrier but it's not, it's producing the same amount of food because you have photons getting to the inner parts of the tree that would not normally get there. So you have more photosynthesis occurring at the inner part of the tree when you have haze. And so the amount of photosynthesis for the whole tree is normal. But with fewer photons directly coming in on the surfaces of the tree, you don't have as much chlorophyll being destroyed, so you don't have the yellow showing up. By Sabi's gold drift, in full sun in the northwest, this is what it looks like. When you grow it in the northeast or southeast, where you have a lot more haze in the air, it can look like this, or actually not even show any yellow, maybe a little bit of yellow tipping on some of the needles, because it needs the impact of the photons on the needles destroying chlorophyll to bring out the yellow. And in the Northwest, in the middle of summer, we have blue sky. I remember when I lived back in Pennsylvania in the middle of summer, the sky was always a whitish color to it from the haze because we would get all the pollutants uh, that would be formed as the air came across the country. Here in the Northwest, our air comes right from the Pacific Ocean. And so we don't have the haze and so our yellows tend to be much more intense. Why do some gold conifers scald? Well, if the sunlight is intense enough to destroy carotenoids as well as chlorophyll, then everybody loses their protection and the high energy photons um, are able to destroy the chlorophyll, the carotenoids, and the cells die. And so then you get these brown patches. And also it can happen with reduced water uptake, not even tied into the color of the plant, where uh, if the ground's frozen in the winter and the sun comes out, like sometimes happens in uh, March, uh, early March, um, the sun is heating this part up, desiccating the foliage, and it can't get water up quick enough and then uh, cells die. Why they turn gold in the winter? Well, there again, Cold weather destroys chlorophyll and carotenoids. Green conifers maintain that balance. If we get excess carotenoids destroyed, then the chlorophyll is not protected <laughs> and the chlorophyll gets destroyed at an even greater rate. And then you can see the carotenoids that are remaining. So here's uh, I see a Pinus reginiana waste gold and witch's broom in the summer and the winter. 
The cold weather in the winter is destroying carotenoids and chlorophyll. And the destroyed carotenoids can no longer protect the chlorophyll. Kind of think of it, um, these aren't the exact ratio, but let's say there's one carotenoid for every four chlorophylls when they're in balance. And maybe half the carotenoids get destroyed, but three of the chlorophylls get destroyed. Now the carotenoids cannot protect as much of the chlorophyll. And so the carotenoids show up. It's kind of funny uh, when you think of it that the fewer the carotenoids in the plant, the more likely it is for them to show because they aren't protecting the chlorophyll. Flesh yellow in the spring, that's because the carotenoids uh, are forming later in the plant cells. Chlorophyll is forming first and then the carotenoids are forming. And since they're not protecting chlorophyll, the chlorophyll is being destroyed almost as fast as it's being created and the carotenoids show up. Eventually, they reach their balance and the plant, uh, the yellow disappears and the chlorophyll takes over. But it's because of the initial lack of carotenoids. Variegation in conifers. Color range from white to yellow. Uh, patches or banding on the needles. Uh, layers of carotenoid deficient cells. If the carotenoid deficient, the chlorophyll is not going to be protected in that area of the needle and the carotenoids will show. Often unstable, for example, uh, the dense flora forms of oculus taconis, or I guess you should say the oculus taconis form the dense of flora, they um, do not show as good a variegation if you're in a cooler climate. Like the north in the Northwest, our nights are, tend to be very cool, even in the middle of August. Uh, having the cooler nights works against the variegation showing up. So uh, like the regular dense of flora octave taconis is not a good plant for us in the Northwest. It tends to just be green. The cooler weather uh, allows more chlorophyll to survive and or allows more and um, more carotenoids. And so the protecting the Chlorophyll um, means that it's going to be green and you're not going to have the yellow. The blue in conifers, the blue is not due to a color coating on the leaf. It's due to wax, a layer of wax on the green needle. And the wax bends light so that we see the blue wavelengths. And the thicker the layer of wax, the bluer the needle will appear. And if you take your finger and rub it over the one of these needles and remove the wax, you'll see the green needle underneath. The wax formed as protection against the desiccation of the needle, keep it from uh, losing too much water and having the plant suffer. When the needles expand out of the winter bud in the spring, the wax forms on the needles as they expand. And it will build up into the early summer. By the time summer rolls around, the wax is no longer being created. Now, the wax can wear off. Here you can see some green in this part of the needle. The wax can wear off over a rough winter. Just a blowing wind with carrying raindrops or snowdrops or ice pellets will knock the wax off of the needles. And when spring comes around, uh, your blue conifer is no longer blue. Now, if you're in an area with a lot of air pollution, uh, that can also remove the wax from the needles. And if you have poor nutrition on the tree, you may not get as much wax developed. There are a number of things that can produce how much of the wax or reduce how much of the wax is created. If you want to help the tree to show a better blue color, nutrition with calcium and magnesium will help. That's calcium nitrate, magnesium sulfate. Applying a little bit of that as a fertilizer will help in, increase the intensity of the blue because it will help the tree develop a heavier layer of wax. And 
it's kind of interesting, but an algicide helps also. It turns out that uh, Vera Holden, a nurturman in Oregon, a uh, man found baby blue eyes, came up with a way of keeping his trees bluer by treating them with an algicide at different times during the spring and summer. Because algae would grow on the inside of the trees on the needles, and the algae would uh, remove the wax. It would uh, assimilate the wax. And here in this, uh, the blues, you can see a little bit of greenish here on the interior where the blue has been wearing away. But it's kind of interesting that algicide actually helps because you wouldn't think of an algicide having any effect on the color. Now, witches brooms, how are they created? Well, cytokinin and auxins are at work here. Uh, something is interfering with an auxin related bud. And here's a witchy broom and a dug fur. The terminal bud, for some reason, exploded in the hundreds of little shoots instead of getting a nice long single shoot coming out of it. Auxin would cause a single shoot to come up, cytokinin would cause this type of growth habit. For some reason, the cytokinin production is interfering with the auxins. Now the cytokinin, evidently there's an excess, here's another broom, there's an excess of cytokinins in this area of the tree, causing this to happen. Something triggered the heavy production of cytokinins in a terminal bud on this branch. And that terminal bud exploded into a bunch of little shoots. The auxins were suppressed by the cytokinins. And it is, is a genetic trait because it carries over into, um, and into the offspring of the broom. Yeah. <clears throat> Here's a witcher broom. It's now dead, but it's in a typical Norway spruce or species Norway spruce in the Catelli collection at the National Arboretum. Here's a close up of the broom, and here's an offspring from the broom. So the characteristics of the broom were carried over into the offspring. So it's genetic. Something happened genetically. And we believe it's due to radiation, the gamma radiation that keeps bombarding us all. Uh, from space, come down and hits things here in the earth. Here are witch of broom seedlings. About 50% witch of broom seedlings are dwarf or slower growing. The witch of brooms tend to be female. It's rare to find a male one, but they do occur. But they tend to be female for some reason. And if you collect the seed from them, they produce a percentage of dwarfs and a percentage of near normal or near normal. Well, that's because the pollen, of course, comes from a species normal tree. And so half of the ge genetics in the seed comes from a normal tree, half comes from the broom. So a gene for dwarfness must be affecting the cytokinins and auxins. Uh, we're getting a little short on time, so I won't go into the genetics here. Uh, just that having half your genes come from the dwarf and half come from normal means you're going to end up having seedlings that are half dwarf and half normal. Now, why do conifers produce so much pollen? And why are the female cones higher in the tree? Well, this shows when plants evolved in geologic time, how long ago it was. Notice all these plant groups evolved before the insects appeared. Insects appeared up here. So these guys had to get pollinated. They had to have their sex cells merged by some other method other than insects, because insects had not yet evolved. When insects evolved, however, they were so efficient that the angiosperms have kind of taken over most parts of the world. Well, wind was the way pollination occurred in the conifers. And because of that, conifers produce a tremendous amount of pollen. Because what are the chances of this, of a grain of pollen from here landing on a female strobili 
in another tree. Not very good. Now, if female cones are produced high in the tree, the male cones or pollen producers are produced low in the tree. That's because you don't want a tree fertilizing its own cones. If the pollen produced up here, most of the pollen would land down here on its own cones. You don't want that. You want this pollen to get picked up by the wind and carried to another tree. You want these cones here to be pollinated by pollen from another tree. And since so wind pollinated, for pollen grain to come in on one of these cones, uh, the odds of that happening are astronomical against it. So you have to have a lot of pollen in the air for, for the pollination to occur. Then we talk about grafting. Here was a graft union. Here's another graft union. Notice sometimes the understock really outgrows the top or the scion, yet it survives. You have a good match or a good knitting here between the top and the base. This compresses glabra, grafted onto uh, Lawson cypress. It's a good, good uh, knit, good match. This Cancerous obtusa grafted on the Lawsoniana. Over in Europe, they used Lawsoniana for understock for many years on obtusa, but the obtusa, uh, the match would often do this. This is at the Trompenburg Arboretum. Here's a grafted by CV Reppens. Here's a rooted one. Here's another. How can you screw this up? Pardon me? Okay, why not remove understock? Well, sometimes the graft, grafted part of the plant is so slow growing that you have to nourish the roots with part of the seedling. So you just keep it clipped back and keep the whole thing in balance. Eventually, you take the understock off, but take it off too quick and the graft can die. Why do you graft on a standard? Well, you accelerated growth for quicker sales, such as over in Holland, nicer cuttings for propagation material, or something artistic, they do a dance sugi. If you want to prevent flopping on a grafted standard, you leave the understock on and you remove it over a period of years. Otherwise, the head overgrows the stem and it falls over. By leaving the side branches on the understock, that'll help it thicken and develop a stronger overall plant. And then Suga canadensis, we'll stop after this one. Suga canadensis must be rooted. It should not be grafted. Because what early loggers discovered, and taxonomists will not agree, is that there are red and white Canadian hemlocks. The white forms were found on ridges and produced superior wood. So it was all logged. And so white hemlocks out in the wilderness are rare. The color is based on the inside of the bark and the hardwood. Now, most cultivars are from white, the white hemlock. And the seedlings that are bought are the red hemlock. And so when you have seedlings of suga candensis, they're from the red hemlock, so the whites are gone. And essentially, whereas the white that survive are your cultivars that were collected. So they were superior plants, and they tended to produce cultivars up in the ridge area where they're, I don't know, maybe easier to find. But when you graft white on red, They'll often take, but you get the um, a high percentage of death over a 10-year, 20-year period. If you grafted 100 suga candensis pendulas, you can figure on losing between 5 and 10 a year. They'll just die in the fields for no apparent reason. And they can even die 20 years after they're planted out because the graft union fails. Okay, we'll, we'll stop at that point, and uh, I don't know if you have any questions or what you do. Well, Bob, thank you, and we're going to ask 
uh, Sherry and Tess <clears throat> to man the chat room. There were questions coming in during the presentation. Okay. Uh, somebody asked, are there any suggested gardens to visit out in the Seattle, Washington area? Um, there's this amazing rock garden at South Seattle Community College. There's the um, bonsai collection at Weyerhaeuser, uh, which is between Seattle and Tacoma, uh, right next to the uh, Rhododendron and Species Foundation. There's the Landon Gardens, uh, which show ancient trees that have been bonsai by Dan Robinson. That's in uh, Bremerton. And uh, we have the Kubota Garden, which is up in Seattle. Uh, those are all, all gardens that could be visited. And then there are a number of members that have nice gardens. Uh, if you're coming out individually, uh, check the membership list and uh, Look for people who have the gardens open and contacting them. It's a real nice garden. So there are some gardens in the Seattle area. My garden is now a half acre. It used to be five acres. Um, I have a few plants, and anybody's welcome to visit, but they won't be overwhelmed with the conifers. <laughs> I think that's all of the questions that I see. Tess? I don't see any more either. Well, either I did a good job or I just snowed everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it was fast and a heck of a lot of information there. But hopefully, yeah, uh, I, just, I feel like I was just in school again. Yeah, well, that's the school teacher in me. That was a yeah, a kind of college. That was my school teacher. That, that's the way I used to lecture in my classes using a PowerPoint. I put the information up there so they could read it, and then I would expand on it in my lecture. Well, you had a good Meryl. class participation today. We had 44 on the Zoom. Yeah. Oh. So that's impressive. Yeah, that's nice. And I like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> and we like to hear you. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. It was wonderful. Was good. Bob, I think a question that, that I had heard, what became of your personal collection? I abandoned it. <laughs> I have to go. Uh, I decided uh, back in, uh, I guess, around 2014 to sell my place because it was five acres and I couldn't enjoy it. Uh, too much work involved. And uh, I had a lot of plants there that were important to me. I really liked having, like a Pinus parviflora gonchinomi. I have, there are four of them there with uh, about an eight inch caliper on the trunks about uh, 25 feet tall and trees like that, that I left, but you know, uh, you're going to have to give it up eventually. Either you're going to carry out on a stretcher or, uh, <laughs> you know, you're just going to sell it. Like I did. Yeah. That's your option. Either some walk away from it or, you know, and then I had no control over it. So the people coming in, I had to make up my mind that if they were going to come in and chainsaw it and grow, race horses, um, more power to them. When I walked away from it, it wasn't mine anymore. There's to do with what they what they would. And I couldn't dig any. I couldn't really dig much because I had very rocky soil. But I knew that when I bought the property. I knew any plant I had in there planted permanently. And so I just made up my mind I was going to leave it. And so I was able to dig a few of the small plants and I propagated some things. And the people who bought it um, are not conifer people and they don't know plants, but they wanted to keep the gardens as much as they could, especially the plants that I pointed out to them that had some special value. And so a lot of the collection is still there. Um, it, it's grown together. One of the things you discover with these gardens is after 20 years, it sure changes. And if you haven't uh, done things to remove plants, uh, it ends up destroying itself, actually, unless you have 100 acres and you really spread everything out. And so I... Uh, in fact, I even hired a couple of college kids and gave them chainsaws and went through and we removed about 300 trees about three years before I sold the place. And there are trees that would cost over a thousand dollars a piece if you were to buy them. But they they were getting crowded and they were destroying each other. And so I went through and decided which plants I wanted kept and 
took some out. So I shrunk the collection three years before I sold the place. But I gave up the business, and so I didn't need the plants for propagation. So I decided it was time to plant a collection that um, was maybe a landscape with some special conifers in it that I could go out and enjoy and not have to uh, worry about maintaining five acres. And I go back to visit once in a while, and I, I see the way plants are growing, and some of them have grown together, and some of them should be removed. But it's not my place anymore, so I just don't let it bother me. And the people who have it are nice and pleasant, and so uh, <clears throat> a lot of the collection is still there. But, you know, eventually they, these things, gardens are living things. They age, and they pass on. Are there any further questions for Bob? No, just lots of thank yous and uh, appreciating a, an amazing technical presentation and um, awesome presentation, Bob. Many thanks all the way around. Very well done. Everyone loved it, Bob. Good, my pleasure. <laughs>